Good morning, First Korean, and good morning to everyone who's joining us today for worship. I want to say thank you to all who are taking part in our service. This morning, we're going to be thinking about our legacy. Let us worship God. First Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This morning's scripture reading comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. This is the word of the Lord. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let us all pray. Father God, our generation hasn't had to face a severe pandemic before, and so we find ourselves living in frightening times. We have a new sense of our fragility and weakness. You are our consolation. You aren't indifferent to our suffering. We remember that Jesus wept at Lazarus' grave and he took Jairus' dead daughter by the hand. We also remember that you, Father, can bring good out of evil. We earnestly ask for success for doctors and scientists searching for a treatment for COVID-19 and for a vaccine against it. Comfort all who suffer and those who selflessly look after them in hospitals, homes and care homes. We pray that when this pandemic passes, we will see a period of social progress, such as we had after the war. Then public housing was improved, education became free, and our great NHS was born. Now we want to live in a fairer society. We want disregarded people, who have now suddenly become key workers, to be given improved pay and recognition. Thank you, Father, for technology. It has enabled us to worship together whilst remaining apart. Last Sunday, we were able to hear from Peter in Nepal, and today we hear from Peter and Anna in Portugal. Thank you for keeping all our mission partners safe. Bless them in their work. Lord, we ask you to comfort all who mourn and all who are ill. We think especially of our own members, those who are recovering from accidents, those who are about to undergo treatment, and those who are anxious about loved ones. Father, hear our prayers. We ask them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I wonder if you can tell me what this is. That's right, it's a plaster. And I'm sure that lots of you have needed a plaster if maybe you have a little cut or a scrape on your knee or your hand or your elbow and you've needed a plaster to help it get better. Sometimes if we have a little bit of a bigger injury, we might even need a bandage. Or if we have a bigger injury, we might have to go to the hospital because sometimes it's too big for us to deal with at home. And lots of times in life, we have lots of different problems that we need to face, sometimes at home, sometimes at school. And sometimes we can think, this problem is just too big for me to solve. I don't know how I am going to do it on my own. Well, today I want to tell you a story about a man who had a really big problem. And his name was Jairus. And Jairus had a little girl who was 12 years old and she was really, really sick and Jairus didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't know how to help her or how he was going to solve this problem. 
But then Jairus heard that Jesus was coming to his town and he thought, great, I know what I will do. I will go and ask Jesus because he can help my little girl. So Jairus ran out of the house and he went straight to find Jesus as quickly as he could. And he fought his way through the crowd. And when he got there, he said, Jesus, please, please, you have to help me. Please come quickly because my daughter is really, really sick. And Jesus said, yes, don't worry, I will come straight away. And Jesus and Jairus were fighting their way through the crowd as quickly as they could to try and get to Jairus' house. But it was really difficult because the crowd was so big. And while they were trying to make their way there, a servant came up and said, Jairus, it's too late. Your little girl has died. You don't need to bother Jesus anymore. But Jesus said, no, I will still come. And so they carried on to Jairus' house. And when they got there, there was a large group of people and they were crying and weeping because the little girl had died. But Jesus and three of his disciples and the mum and the dad went into the house and Jesus said, don't worry, the little girl is just sleeping. And they thought, no, Jesus, the girl has died. But Jesus went up to her and took her hand and said, child, get up. And the little girl got up because Jesus was able to bring her back from the dead. You see, no one thought that Jesus was going to be able to solve this problem. They thought it was too big. They thought maybe if she was sick, that Jesus could help her. But when she had died, they thought, no, this is just too big. But the Bible tells us that no problem is too big for Jesus and that he really was able to bring the little girl back from the dead. And he said, go and get her something to eat but don't tell anyone what has happened here today. And boys and girls, this is still true for us today, that no problem is too big for Jesus. Lots of times in our life, in home or in school, we face ourselves with problems and we can think, this is just too big for me to deal with. But we can remember this story and remember that no problem is too big for Jesus. So the next time we face a problem, we can remember that we can talk and pray to Jesus and ask him to help us. Let's pray together now. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were able to heal Jairus' daughter and we thank you that no problem is too big for you to solve. We pray that we will trust you and ask for your help when we need it. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hello everyone. Hi. And thank you very much for praying for us during these strange times. Yes, um, our family are well in the London area and we're thankful to the Lord for that. And we are very well here in Lisbon. Uh, we have had to obviously postpone our move to Greece, which was to have happened in the first week of May. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm very grateful to God that I've been able to hand over my own leadership responsibilities for the team here in, in Portugal to a good friend and colleague, Alex, and I'm continuing to work with him through this transition period. I continue with member care, um, which is pastoral care, until we uh, leave for Greece. Yeah. But in the meantime, God has opened up amazing opportunities for us, both with our small church plant. I'm leading Bible studies. We're looking at the, appearance, the resurrection appearances of Jesus at the moment in, in a, over a Zoom meeting. And um, we continue with our Bible studies with Sarah, who's from the Middle East, who is really growing in her faith and has expressed a desire to be baptized. For me, it's really uh, exciting to see just how much she grasps and how quickly she grasps things. Coming from a very, a totally non-Christian background, um, we were introducing her to the Sermon on the Mount and uh, she immediately picked up when we said, when, when we read how Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. And that's exactly, she said, well, that's how I am. I'm poor in spirit. And uh, it was just so wonderful to see her big smile when she recognized how Jesus spoke to her. So continue to pray for our transition and wisdom to know when we should move to Athens. Thank you so much.
We're beginning to ask what life will be like when this is all over. What will be the same and what will be different? In his second letter, Peter is nearing the end of his days. And his heart is that we would remember the very great and precious promises long after he's gone. I'll set my gaze on God alone and trust in him completely. With every day pour out my soul and he will prove his mercy. Though life is but a fleeting breath, a sigh too brief to measure. My king has crushed the curse of death and I am his forever. My soul finds a rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation. A fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I fix my heart on righteousness. I look to him who hears me. Oh, praise him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer, my God. Find a rest, my soul, in God alone world's temptation when evil seeks to take a hold i'll cling to my salvation but though riches come and riches go don't set your heart upon them the fields of hope in which i sow are harvested in heaven on God alone and trust in Him completely with every day pour up my soul and He will prove His mercy though life is but a fleeting breath a sigh too brief to measure my King has crushed the curse of death and I am His forever A mother was homeschooling and she posed a problem to her children. A wealthy man died and left a legacy of 10 million pounds. One fifth is to go to his daughter, she said. One fifth is to go to his son and one sixth to his brother and the rest to his wife. Now, what does each get after a long silence? Little Jane said, a lawyer? Many people have been asking, what will be the legacy of these pandemic days? When it's all over, will we have a different view of life? Those are good questions. I've seen a few social media posts saying things like, from now on, I'm going to live every day as if it was my last. Well, that's a challenging thought, but it isn't possible, even if you wanted to. You'll very soon find yourself sitting in front of a screen, stuffing your face with chocolate. Which of us when we've seen the pictures of the intensive care units over the past days, hasn't thought, that could be me. The reason 
we've been distancing ourselves and isolating is because we know that could be me this week. We've all been confronted with the frailty of life and the certainty of death. Not something we've been used to, not something that we're comfortable with, but it's been a reality for us. Peter has been urging Christians because they have known God's forgiveness and because they've known God's grace and because God has given them his power and his promises. He's been encouraging them to make every effort to live good lives. And last week we saw what that looked like. And now, in the next section, he's going to give us some good reasons. I want to share just two things this morning. The first is this. Peter tells us to live like we're leaving. We have a very different view of death than the generations before us. The early Puritans believed the aim of every person should be to die well. What they meant by that was that in life and in death, the aim was to remain faithful to God. There was a man called Polycarp. He had been a disciple of the apostle John and he became a minister of a place called Smyrna. When he was 86 years old, he was arrested because of his faith in Jesus. The Romans tried to get him to repent of it all and to say, Curious Kaiser, Caesar is Lord. And the old man said, You know, for 86 years I've served him and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme the king who saved me? Because of that, the executioner said, I'm going to burn you and I'm going to make the fire hotter. And Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire that burns for one hour. And you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. How's that for dying well? Peter in verse 12 says, for this reason... If you go back to verse 11, you'll see that he's been writing about the prospect of entering heaven. So he's living knowing that he is leaving. And that future hope becomes his present motivation. For Peter, death was an imminent prospect. Verse 14 tells us that the Lord revealed to him that he didn't have much time left. And the word that he uses for it in verse 15 is very interesting. He says, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, departure, the word that he uses is actually the word exodus. It's a word that's used for leaving one place on your way to another place, leaving here for somewhere better. Now you might be thinking, well, that's okay for Peter. Of course, you'd have your death in mind when you're in your 70s but not in your 20s, not in your 30s. Nobody thinks of those things then. Well, probably very few do it these days. But Peter would say that's not healthy. It is true that the questions we ask are different as we journey through the decades. When you're in your 20s, you're thinking, who am I? And what am I? And where's my life heading? When you get to your 30s, there are marriages and mortgages. And you start asking questions like, how did I become responsible for all of this? And what, whatever happened to all the fun? And when you get to your 40s, you start asking questions like, why are all my friends doing better than I am? And when you get to your 50s and the doctor says to you, well, you know, at your age, you start to ask, what? Am I that old? Why do I need to have a wee doze after tea time? And when you get to your 60s, you ask, why do all my friends talk so much about retirement? And when you get to your 70s, you ask, how many years do I have left? How will it happen? How will I die? Does anyone know who I once was? That's the question of significance. So admittedly, the older you get, the more you do think about the end of life. But Peter hints that it was unwise, and it is unwise, to wait that long. As Solomon wrote, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take it to heart. 
And here's why that is actually important. It is actually refreshing and healthy to deal with facts and to have that kind of focus in your life. Twice Peter here uses the word tent. He's talking about putting off his earthly tent. Now Peter was a fisherman. It was Paul who was the tent maker. I wonder, does this mean that Paul had already put off his earthly tent? Do you like camping? I asked our staff that question this week and the answer was no. They talked about their liking creature comforts and they talked about not roughing it. When you're in a tent, you are down to the basics and that's okay for a while. But it's just temporary. It's just a temporary thing. Especially if you're experienced living in a house, you want to get back there. Now your body, Peter says, is like a tent. It's temporary. And after a while, the threads unravel, the flaps get torn, and the tent leaks. Well, you can surgically lift the tent flaps, and you can dye the threads so that they're unraveling, and you can patch up the tears, but eventually things wear out. And there isn't much you can do about it. It's kind of depressing, isn't it? But Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions When I think I'm going to trade this tent in for a mansion, well, that fills me with great hope. One day we will move from one place to another. The tent will disintegrate and we will make our exodus. Is it any wonder that Paul writes in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Peter's getting older and his tent is failing, but his focus is on others. So he isn't just living like he's leaving. The second thing he wants us to know is, leave a legacy. Peter is leaving a legacy. Four times he uses the word your, and 11 times you. Peter in his last days is thinking about others by reminding them of the things that they already know by going over the basics. Maybe as you've heard what Peter has said today, you've been thinking to yourself, James, is that all there is this morning? I know all of that. But Peter says, I think that it is right that I remind you of what you already know. A good teacher does that. A good coach does that. They'll keep giving you reminders and practicing the fundamentals. Solomon repeats himself in his Proverbs, David in his Psalms, and Jesus in his parables. And here's why. Because you and I forget so quickly and so easily. The average person will, well, if you haven't already switched off and gone for a cup of coffee, the average person will remember only 25% of this. If you listen to it again, you might remember a little bit more than that. And the more you hear it, and the more you think about it, the more you will retain That's why here in First Coleraine, we are so focused on Bible study on Sundays and during the week. So here's what Peter's saying. I know you know this stuff already, but I'm spending my last days leaving you a legacy. Instead of becoming consumed with himself and his own worries, Peter is consumed by his concern for others and the legacy that he's leaving. One day, you and I are going to die unless the Lord comes back before then. What are you going to leave behind you? Listen to what Peter says in verse 15. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Here's Peter's legacy. He is making every effort and he's writing these letters. Think about that for a moment. At a time when Peter was writing, most people could neither read nor write. There are some words and phrases that are going to be in the dictionary after this year. And I'm sure one of the phrases that will enter the dictionary will be Zoom meeting. Last year I had a meeting with a guy in Scotland and he set up this meeting on an app called Zoom. I had never heard of it before. And I thought that after the meeting was over, I would just delete the app. Well, aren't I glad I was too lazy to do it? At a time when few could read or write, P 
Peter had the vision to put these things in writing. And after 2,000 years, we are still being reminded and still being instructed by the letters of First and Second Peter. Talk about leaving a legacy that outlives you. One of the reasons that Peter knew that his time was up was because of a promise that Jesus had given to him when he was a young man. It was right after the resurrection. Jesus said to Peter, Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. And by that, Jesus told Peter the way in which he was going to die. Then he said to Peter, follow me. So Peter had a promise from Jesus. When I'm old, this is going to happen to me. Now that's very helpful to know because when you go to passages like Acts chapter 12 where James has been killed by Herod and Peter has been arrested and he's threatened with death himself, it says, and Peter fell asleep between two guards. How do you fall asleep knowing that you're going to die the next day? Do you just say, well, I'm going to die tomorrow, night, night. But you know why he could do that? Because Jesus said, Peter, when you're old, you're going to die. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was still a young man. So he said, good night. And he went to sleep. He remembered Jesus' promises. And he believed Jesus' promises. And he rested on Jesus' promises. But now he's old. And the tent is frayed. And the exodus has come. And Peter wants us to remember Jesus' promises and to believe Jesus' promises and to rest on Jesus' promises. That is his legacy. So I ask you, what are you leaving behind? What's your legacy going to be? What are you leaving for the next generation? John Piper wrote this. Getting old to the glory of God means getting old in a way that makes God look glorious. It means living and dying in a way that shows God to be the all-satisfying treasure that he is. So that would include, for example, not living in ways that make this world look like your treasure, which means that most of the suggestions that this world offers for your retirement years are bad ideas. They call us to live in a way that would make this world look like our treasure. And when that happens, God is belittled. I know that this hasn't been an easy thing for you to hear. I know that because it hasn't been an easy thing for me to hear either. But a good friend is one who will help you to examine your life, no matter how difficult that is. Peter has been such a friend to us this morning. Proverbs 30, 13 and verse 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Don't let your legacy be a fraction of a portfolio of cash, cars, cribs and credentials. Things that will decay like the tent you inhabit. May our legacy be that we are living and dying in a way that shows God to be the all-satisfying treasure that he truly is. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we think of Peter's example, his ministry and his mistakes. He was far from perfect as we are. But as he faced death, he was faithful as we want to be. Help us think wisely about our exodus and grant us grace to leave a legacy of faithfulness that endures for generations to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with you this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Shut
Take.